I'm Vinny Politan. The subject of our investigation is the suspected Long Island Gilgo Beach serial killer. For years, we knew so little about this story, and now, with an arrest and a pending trial, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Here's the story. The investigation into the suspected Long Island Gilgo Beach serial killer has revealed some very shocking things. And it all begins with the suspect himself. He lived and worked among us in society, functioning as an architect, a husband, and a father, commuting from Massapequa into New York City. From there, however, much of what we learn seems to fit the mold of a serial killer, a strange home in a neighborhood which seemed kind of out of place, awkward interactions with people and a seemingly large interest in the Long Island killings. But it took years to make an arrest. First, a local police corruption scandal sidetracked everything until a new task force was formed. And once they started their investigation, it took only months to zero in on a suspect. Now that suspect is getting ready for trial as his family is now put in the spotlight as they also wait. So... When the arrest was made, I mean, this was big, big news, and, and it was a very public event, and the DA making the announcement of, of what they had determined and what they believed had happened, who they believed was responsible, and what some of the evidence was. Take a listen. On March 14th, 2022, the name Rex Heurman was first mentioned as a suspect uh, in the Gilgo case. A New York State uh, investigator was able to, uh, to um, identify him in a database. Uh, and from that point on, we used the power of the grand jury, over 300 subpoenas and search warrants, uh, looking into this, uh, this individual's background to bring us to this day. At the time of the, uh, each of the murders, uh, the murderer, the, the defendant, Herman, uh, he got a, a uh, he got a, a cell phone uh, and a burner phone, which, uh, which is prepaid and anonymous. And for each of the murders, he got an individual burner phone. And he used that to communicate with the victims. Uh, then shortly after uh, the death of the victims, uh, he then would, uh, would get rid of the burner phone. We looked at the Urman family uh, travel records. And we learned that during the murders of uh, the last three women, um, Bartholomew, Waterman and Costello, that during the commission of those murders, the, the, uh, the defendant's wife and children were, at, were out of New York State, and he was alone in the tri-state area. Uh, we also went back and looked at his cell site records, and we, were, we, we compared his personal cell site records with that of the four target phones, and we saw that there was areas of commonality. In other words, now, whenever the, the target phones would, uh, would, would bounce off a cell tower, if, if the uh, Yerman uh, personal phone uh, bounced off a, a, a tower, it was always consistent and in close proximity uh, with the target phones. We followed his use of burner phones. We were able to uh, identify seven separate burner phones that he used. We were able to use fictitious uh, or fraudulent email addresses and get Google warrants, and from there we got his searches, uh, and we learned uh, what we what uh, the individual what the defendant was searching. Uh, in a 14-month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to uh, the Gilgo investigation. Uh, not only were those, uh, was he looking at uh, in investigative insight. Uh, he was looking, trying to figure out how is the task force using cell phones to try to figure out what's happening. One of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, we also got uh, DNA samples, abandonment samples from his family. And then we went back and we got mitochondrial DNA testing. Extensive investigation laying out some of the evidence, including uh, allegedly some DNA evidence in this case. So when this was made public, the public's like, oh, wow, these guys and, and, and women really put together some case here. But remember the, the backstory here. He, he's not just an accused serial killer. He's a father. He's a husband and has a family. And that brings me 
to my question in this investigation, which is, does his family think he's the killer? Right? And these are the people in the world closest to an accused serial killer. What do they believe about the man who's a member of their family, the patriarch of the family? Joining me to help answer this one, the family law attorney representing the children of the accused killer, uh, Ves Mitev, and attorney for the accused killer's estranged wife, Bob Macedonia, is joining us as well. He's on the phone. Um, Bob, I'm going to go to you first. Um, it's her husband, or was her husband. They were married. They were building a, and living a life together. D does she believe that the man who's been arrested and charged with being this serial killer is the killer. She does not believe that the man she was married to for 27 years and the father of her daughter, Victoria, and the stepfather to Christopher is capable of committing the crimes as alleged. You have to recall, we, we have seen no evidence, uh, either documentation, DNA, or any kind of forensics. We've had conclusory statements that have been issued to the press by the district attorney's office and the task force. That's all that any of the press, any individuals in the public have seen. So at this point, she doesn't believe he's capable of committing these crimes. And like she's previously stated, she's going to withhold her judgment until she sees and hears the evidence in the courtroom. That sounds fair. That sounds fair to me. I, which is, I, honestly, which is what we should all do in this country. That's what the, the basis of our Constitution calls well, yeah, The jury absolutely has to do it. Um, Ves Mitev, I, I want to take a listen to Rodney Harrison. And, and here he is um, on CNN talking about the family's reaction to all this from his perspective. When we initially uh, informed them about uh, their, their husband, their father, uh, they, were, they were shocked. Um, they were disgusted. Uh, they were embarrassed. Uh, so if you ask me, I, I don't believe that they knew about this double life that Mr. Harriman was, was, was living. But uh, you know, time will tell. And once again, is there still a lot more questioning that needs to be done to the family, to friends, uh, taking a look at some of the calls that are coming in and seeing uh, what information we could gather to see if the family might have known exactly what, what Mr. Harriman was up to. Okay, Vess, uh, uh, I guess you could address both of those. Like, do, do the children, did they ever suspect anything, have information, number one? And number two, do they believe at this point that he's, he's the killer? Well, I think uh, Lovecraft said it best. Uh, the most merciful thing about the human mind is its inability to correlate all of its contents. So if uh, my two clients and ever had an ounce of inkling that any of this was going on, I, I dare say that it would have uh, appeared a long time ago and it would have wrecked their frame of mind. And obviously, you know, piecing together these bits of disassociated knowledge, which is all that we've been able to do watching this case unfold for the last year and several months, it's obviously opened up some terrifying vistas for the people that are watching it um, on the sideline, as, as my clients are. But in, in no way, shape, or form did they ever have such an inkling. I think it's safe to say that they all cumulatively together resided in a, on a, you know, a placid island of, of blissful ignorance, which they still reside upon. Because as, as we've pointed out, and as we keep saying at this point, all you have is allegations, and it's a quantum leap between an allegation and a conviction. So, of course, they, the family unit um, that they've become has have become more more co uh, cohesive as a result of this, of course. Uh, and, and, and in no way, shape, or form, Vinny, did they ever um, imagine, dream, suspect uh, that, that such allegations would be made. And again, we're a long ways away from those allegations uh, becoming even a remote uh, conviction. Let's take a listen to uh, Ray Tierney here talking about, uh, this is the, the district attorney, talking about some of the things that were seized. All of the guns that were recovered, and we're talking about 283, about, two, about approximately 279 um, uh, weapons were, were recovered. Uh, you know, they, they're being categorized. Some may not categ you know, some may not be complete weapons. Some may not uh, be able to be defined as a weapon under New York State law. But uh, suffice to say, there was quite a few uh, weapons uh, found in the house. Bob Macedonia, what about all the weapons? Um, that were found in the house. Was, was, was that known to the family that, that all these weapons were inside? 
they knew, well, I, I shouldn't say they, I know, I speak on behalf of Ox, I'm not sure what the children knew or did not know. Uh, Rex, we have to understand, was an active member of the NRA, did lecture at, at various uh, functions that they had, and so they knew he was an avid collector of firearms, both as was his father and grandfather. Some of these items were passed down through generations in the human family that date back to the Civil War. So it, I don't think she knew the number. I don't think anybody ever counted. Um, so, I, yes, they knew there was weapons in the house, and that's what that, that safe was put in that house for. Vess, um, as we take a look at, at some of the images from outside of the home and, and inside the home, um, that's something else that has struck a lot of people. This is a very nice neighborhood. It seems like he was making a good living, yet it doesn't seem that they were living up to that standards that you would expect. Did the, did, did the kids kind of question why um, you know, all this stuff is inside? and why the outside of the home was in somewhat of disrepair? Did they, did they take anything away from that? What's the, what's the explanation for that? Well, I think what you're seeing obviously is the aftermath of an absolute um, you know, hurricane level uh, search and seizure effort, the likes of which we have not seen, uh, certainly in my time practicing law on a case that, that has captured the nation's imagination. So what you're looking at obviously is what was the aftermath of law enforcement tearing through their house, not once, but twice, you know, as far as their home's modesty, as far as their home's appearance, uh, you know, not all of us are, are fortunate enough to live in um, homes that, that we can, um, you know, boast about or, 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 you know, flaunt. Some, some people are content with, with living in a family home, with having a small family unit, with having, you know, a somewhat idyllic landscape and, and being in a, in a very, um, what some people would call a modest setting that's it's enough for some people and and we shouldn't forget that what you're seeing and what has been trotted out in, in public displays the reason that they're sitting on their porch as you see right there is because there was no place for them to reside inside because the place was torn down from the floorboards to the rafters i mean you recall they cut the uh the oil traps out of the sinks you saw there that the bathtub was cut into so they were displaced they were refugees in their own home for months it's not gotten back to normal. So I can't say anything except that the state of their house served them very, very well for many, many years before any of this came to the national forefront. And yes, they do live in a modest house. We, we freely acknowledge that. They've lived a, a very modest middle-class existence. That's who they are. Ves Mitev and uh, Bob Macedonio, um, thank you both so much. And I, I say it every time I speak with both of you, the, the, the good news for the family is that um, you two are handling this for them and helping them through the process. All right, we've got more to come, folks. And, and it's a big question, right? A lot of people are asking this one. Is there more to this? She would have a sex partner and they would go to certain sex clubs in New York City where they would switch partners with other people of like kind. One of the most successful true crime TV shows ever. This is crazy. Now has a new home on America's original true crime obsession. 48 hours on Court TV. Coming up next on Court TV. Tell me in your own words and in as much detail as you can, what happened that night? The couple went to La Trapeze, and I think it was on the wall at La Trapeze where an advertisement was placed to go to a house in Massapequa Park for partying, for switching, for swapping. They ended up going to Rex Uriman's house. In the house was the wife of Rex Uriman and uh, Rex Uriman and the, the, the other girl. The other girl who we believe to be Karen Vergata. That's attorney Johnny Ray. Controversial figure in, in all of this related to the uh, suspected Long Island serial killer. But this is the man who has, has kept beating the drum because for years no one was doing anything about this investigation. Nothing was getting done. But he continued to make the noise. 
He represented originally the family of Shannon Gilbert. Shannon Gilbert is dead, but Shannon Gilbert, before she died, made a 911 call from the same area. Shannon Gilbert was the investigation that led to the discovery of all of these victims that the uh, suspected Long Island serial killer has been charged with. It was from her case, looking for her. Take a listen to the call. State police. Yeah, there's somebody asking me. I'm sorry? There's somebody asking me. Where are you? There's somebody asking me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody asking me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. No, stop it, please. Stop it, please, please, uh, stop no, it. No, no. Please stop it, no, please stop it. These people are trying to kill me, and then she's found dead. They've investigated her case, and, and they've come back and said, no, she's not a victim of, 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 of any of this. They're also saying her case is not connected to the other escorts who were all found dead in that area on, near Gilgo Beach. She was found dead. She's an escort. Other escorts. No connection. Which brings me to my next question. Is there more to this? Is it just this guy by himself? Or is there something else going on here? Is it just a coincidence that Shannon Gilbert happened to make the 911 call and this investigation led to uncovering all this and she has nothing to do with it? Joining me, retired police commander, author of the book Deceived, and host of the Profile, e Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King, and the host of the Hidden Killers podcast, Tony Bruschi. Welcome to you both. Tony, your thought, I mean, there, I generally come from the, the perspective, I don't believe in coincidences, all right? Prove sure. that it's not a coincidence to me. But that's what everyone keeps saying. It's just a coincidence, Shannon Gilbert and these other escorts, nothing, nothing to see here. Uh, Johnny Ray has made some allegations. People have uh, refuted it. Um, what are your thoughts? Is there more to this? I think that people like this, they, they do travel in, in covert packs, so to speak. A lot of them are not necessarily always lone wolves in this. Um, and I think that that may be a connection we're going to see at some point in time. We know there was a lot of people uh, out there, uh, a lot of people recently been charged out in that area for some things like this. I'm not making that connection, but we do know uh, with the uh, former ch uh, police chief, James Burke, he was involved in some areas of uh, this that were rather questionable. Uh, it does certainly raise some eyebrows and make you wonder a little bit, um, was there some not investigating going on. Not that he necessarily had anything to do with this one specifically, but overall, it took forever for us to get anywhere on this case. Thanks to John Ray, uh, a lot of attention kept staying on it. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's a connection. Is it always the same killer or person connected to all the victims? No. But, but I think in a greater sense, we will find relationships there. Mike King, as we, we look at the, the story, I remember when it was all breaking and like, you know, another day, another discovery, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, yet here we are at this point, and everything is not necessarily connected. He hasn't been charged with everything. You had a police chief who did everything he could to quash the investigation. FBI, keep the FBI away from this. We don't want them involved here. They might figure out what's going on. And that makes everyone suspicious. So what are your thoughts? Is there more to this? Well, I think there's more to the area, Vinny, and, and I, I think our mind wants to just immediately charge Hearman with anything else going on out there and say, we got a serial killer, because we have this need to say, I'm safer now, I've got it solved, this thing is wrapped up and put away in a bow. It, I have to look at this more as like a serial location, not a serial killer so much. And I've walked these uh, pathways. I've I've crawled around out in the, the brush out where Shannon Gilbert was found. 
Um, I walked through that, even that secluded neighborhood in Oak, uh, where she was uh, going house to house. And it wasn't very far between all those houses, Vinny. I mean, it's like three football fields between the first and second home and, and less than a football field to the next home where she's screaming and going from house to house. And then she ends up, of course, out in the marsh uh, where her body is recovered later. So it keeps taking me back to things that would suggest to me more we have a serial location more than one serial killer responsible for all these bodies. All right, we're a little short on time. Uh, Tony Bruschi, Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi. Thank you so, so much. Next time, we'll have more time, I, 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 trust me. Mike King, great to see you as well. Thank you uh, so you. much. You know, it, it's hard to believe that it has taken this long to get to the point where we are. I mean, all those bodies, all those victims and no sense of justice right now for any of them. It's been more than 14 years. And, and the bottom line, when, when you talk about an investigation, a case like this, regardless of who the victim is, each victim deserves the same attention. Each victim deserves the same dignity. And that wasn't the case early on in this Gilgo investigation. But now it looks like things have turned around and it's time for the truth to be publicly revealed in a public courtroom. I'm Vinnie Politan. We'll keep digging for answers as the investigation continues.